Hey guys, welcome back to Connor Reads. I'm Connor and I've been reading and what I just finished reading is Path of Daggers. Um, so I'm really just gonna go through my thoughts, theories, predictions, and just general waffle about this book. Obviously there's gonna be spoilers from the outset and throughout, so let's hop into it. First thing I wanna say is that when I started reading these uh, Wheel of Time series, one thing that was pretty unanimous across every single person that I spoke to who recommended this is that there is a slog. And what their description of the slog was is there's a period of time um, during the series where it gets difficult to read, it's very political, not much happens. And I've been really worried about it, but having finished the eighth book and some people say that the slog starts as early as the seventh, I really haven't um, noticed it. Like I've really enjoyed these books. And this eighth book especially, it had a really long action-packed period at the end of the book, probably longer than any of the other books that I can remember. So we had obviously the Sean Chan and the skirmishes with them, Rand, Kalendor, all of that. Um, we also had um, Elaine like, moving into Camelin. We had the progression with the Prophet, and we also had um, a bunch of other stuff as well. So we're gonna unpack some of that. First with the Sean Chan. So we get some incredible scenes. We have Rand um, leading his people to attack the Sean Chan that have come and landed in Ebu Dar. And we get some cool perspectives from the Sean Chan. And there's some cool words thrown out. So there's choosers, death watch guards, we have ogre gardeners. And although not much of that is explained, the death watch guards are a little bit, it's like the um, Royal Bloodlines uh, representative or the Empress's representative, I believe. Um, they're around as like her representative to remind people that she is coming. Um, but all of that just makes me really hungry to learn more about the Sean Chan. Uh, we're in the eighth book and although we've learned bits and pieces about them, as a whole, they're still quite mysterious. I really love these action scenes. Now, Robert Jordan, when he does battles, he doesn't really, unless it's one-on-one, -on -one, he doesn't really do like cut and blow descriptions, which I really like. As a whole, he's more focused on the choices and actions of people rather than like the small nitty gritty battle things, which I like because although I do love a nitty gritty battle, um, every other fantasy author is quite obsessed with it. So it's quite refreshing to have a more overarching view of battle and much more magical, magically focused as well. Now Rand finally uses Kalendor, and I've always wondered why he goes into these battles without you know, the powerful Tarangrials, Sangrials, and Angrials that are available to him, and Kalendor is one of three of the most powerful in the world. Unfortunately, it doesn't go his way though. Um, he absolutely goes mental with it, kind of loses his mind and starts killing everyone around him. However, he does destroy the Sean Chan's army. And we later find out from Cad Swan, I believe, that the only way to um, safely will Kalendor is to link with two women. So I want to predict who he eventually links up with. So I think logically it would be Elaine and Avinda, seeing as they both love him and, and he loves them. Like it'd be someone he's willing to open his himself up to. But I think it would be much more poetic for it to be Egwin and Nynaeve because it would take a lot more trust to do that. It would be three of the most powerful um, people, uh, humans, in the entire story. So the power they could wield would be immense. Um, and it would just be poetic because they all came from the very first chapters together in the very same place. However, knowing Robert Jordan, it would probably see, be some really bittersweet moment where it's like Mogedian and, I don't know, Elader or something like that. So we'll see. If I had to guess, it would be Avinda and Elaine. And the big and exciting thing is that Sidon and Sidar are um, eager is the word that's described in Ebu Dar. And we haven't really seen this before, I don't think. So my guess is it's one of two things. Either number one, and much less likely, it's the bowl of winds being used has done something to alter uh, Sidon and Sidar in that area. But I don't think that's the case. The only other thing that I feel like we know of that's happened in that area is, I think it was Elaine pulling apart the weave and that caused a ton of issues. And it was kind of directly after that that the Sean Chan mentioned that their Daman, Daman couldn't channel anymore and they were like sick. So that would be my guess. And I predict that obviously that's gonna be really important in the future because Rand wants to throw the taint off of uh, the male side of the power. So anything that can affect the power like that, uh, it's gonna be really important. We also discovered that Sean Chan have the same prophecy with the dragon. Now, I actually think that's a good thing because it means at least in principle, they know that Rand has to battle the final battle, has to battle Time and Guide On. So it's like they can't kill him, which is great news, but it also means they might be able to be cowed, they might be able to be strapped to the cause because they already know that's going to happen. 
So if they can be brought round to see Sense, at least I think it would be Sense, letting Rand roam free, he's a bit mental now. Um, you know, hopefully they could be strapped to the cause. So fingers crossed. My big prediction for this storyline is I think we're going to see the Sean Chan's homeland. So obviously they have a ton of people. It was mentioned briefly by one of the Sean Chan that had been captured by Savannah that hundreds of thousands of them were coming across, meaning that they must have a land, you know, roughly as big as the mainland um, where the story is set. So I originally thought that's what was going to happen. I thought we were going to open up a window to the Sean Chan's um, like island, land, area, zone, I don't know, uh, because it was mentioned you can go places that you've never been to before um, on one of the forms of traveling. And I thought Ran was going to lead his army straight across there. Um, but obviously he didn't, he went into the hills in Ebudar, which was really cool, well, around Ebudar, which was really cool as well. So my prediction is, and it's going to be Matt that goes there. Matt either gets shipped over there or he meets the, um, the Empress in some way, shape or form. I'm sticking strong to this prediction with Matt that he is going to be crucial to the Sean Chan storyline. Then we move to the White Tower and Alvarin has Elada completely wrapped up, it would seem. Until one of the Seekers um, that uh, Elada kind of employs um, is taking people all the way down to the bottom of the White Tower and using the Oath Rod. And the Oath Rod is massively overpowered. It's really, really cool. And what happens while we're down there is um, they are walked in on by several of the other, I think it's the heads of the, no, it's not the heads, it's sitters, I believe, that come down and they want to figure out what's going on. And basically what they say is, um, hey, we have this Oath Rod. You guys are going to take the Oath. Everyone take the Oath and then tell us that you're not dark friends, basically. And... Then one of them, and what was their name? Talin. So Talin basically is like all up for it and then finds out they have the Oath Rod and she's like, oh, you have something that I can't lie whilst using and you need me. We're all going to say that we're not dark friends and there's no way of lying. I've actually got something I need to do. <laughs> I've got to go right now. That is so funny that she really tried that. She probably tried to style that out as well. So um, I think a couple of things could have happened here. What would be amazing is if that is the Forsaken that's hiding in the White Tower, because that would be such a stupid way to get caught. But I was thinking, what if the, uh, is it Masana? Uh, if, if, what if she is one of the ones who's been chosen as the Seekers by Elena? That would be, you know, checkmate. That would be incredible. But I probably, I don't think so, because they both take that oath with the oath rod, and so they're not dark friends. Um, while they're down there as well. So I really love this storyline. It's an incredible how uh, complicated all the storylines are. So we, we have good, bad, in-between, not sure uh, characters in every single storyline. And there's so many of them. And it's just so rewarding to be this deep into a story and to still know everything that's happening and what's going on. Well, not everything that's happening, but I know like what's going on in every scene. And I remember the history of all of them. And it's just been a really good journey. So it's really like an appreciation moment where I'm like, this is great. We have layers upon layers upon layers here. And then we have Egwin and her team arriving at Tarvalon. Now I predict this, this storyline is going to be slow. Everything that we've had with the Aya Sedai because of tradition and how they have managed to really live, you know, for thousands of years without um, battling each other or anything like that because of their oaths, which is you know, admirable. I think that storyline is going to be very slow. It's going to be very political. It's going to be a ton of vying for power, vying for, vying for uh, position until it explodes. But I really could see, you know, at Robert Jordan's pace, you never know. It might all happen next book. I think really it's going to be stretched over a, couple, a book or two, that whole scenario. And what's that, what I think is going to happen, so my prediction is, I predict that all the bad things that Egwin's ever done is going to come out. Like her having captured Morgidian, surely the other Forsaken who's hiding in the tower knows about that. Like from the Dark One or just from the Forsaken WhatsApp group. <laughs> from the Forsaken and how they, you know, go about things. So, um, yeah, so I feel like that will come out and a couple of that pretending to be I said I will come out and a few other things as well. But eventually she will prevail. And it's hard to see that she wouldn't. And the reason for that is because she has so many um, of the like wilders and people who didn't think they could get to the uh, to, to be I said I who are with her now. So although they're like pretty raw, that's a ton of extra magical power. Plus they have Gareth Byrne, who's like maybe the greatest general in the book. Um, they, she also has Gawain, who I believe is um, on the White Tower's side, you know, on paper, 
but obviously he loves her and there was a prophecy that he kneels or he kills her so i'm hoping he doesn't kill her um but yeah so he must kneel and bring the fighters across to them as well so yeah we'll see what happens but i can't see it going anyway except for Edwin winning then after ebudar rand goes back to the castle to the keep to the sun palace i believe it is and everything goes crazy but first, I want to talk about Cad Swan. I have a real like soft spot for Cad Swan. And from what I've seen so far, she's quite a polarizing character. Obviously, I'm only on book eight, so I don't have all the information. I probably don't even have the tip of the iceberg. Maybe I have like five to 10% of you know the lowdown of what's really happening, but incredible scene. So basically, Rand goes to Cad Swan and his goal really is to show her, hey, listen, I'm the boss here. Uh, you need me, I don't need you, all that jazz. And she completely turns him upside down. And basically, she puts herself as his advisor, but without her really having to promise anything at all. And with him having to promise, you know, to her rules. And I just think she's awesome. Um, if she turns out to be bad, I'll be very upset because she's just amazing. Like She's obviously so talented and all that comes from experience. And she's, you know, the master of the conversation. On the other hand, Soralia. I'm starting to not like Soralia that much. And the reason for that is, number one, she seems quite heartless. Um, the way she deals with the Aes Sedai who were in her possession, and I know they were really bad people and they locked up Rand and stuff, so you know, I get that. But she just is like starting to make me a little bit suspicious. And I've always said there's one, at least there has to be at least one high up wise one, because who killed Asmodine? right? And there has to be at least one high up wise one who's a dark friend. And I'm not saying Sorrel is the dark friend, but I know one, I'm like suspicious that a wise one has to be. But what made me suspicious is as Rand, as Sorrel is, sorry, is leaving Rand in the Sun Throne just before um, his Asherman, a couple of them, the ones who decide to try and kill him, blow up the whole room. She is written like she, she makes a decision. She pauses decides whether to tell him or not, and then gets him out of the room by saying, hey, listen, you know, Cad Swan's in the building, you know, you should go and speak to her, essentially. But it was like the, the way Robert Jordan described it, and I might be clutching at straws, as one person said in the last video on the comments, I do go massively off tangent with huge predictions based on like one line that could mean nothing. And you're right, but it is fun. So yeah, I feel like Sorrelia is something fishy about her. I'm not ready to say that I predict that she's a dark friend, but there's something fishy. I also don't think she could have killed Asmodeen because it's always said that she can't channel very much and Asmodeen was obviously quite proficient. But then again, Asmodeen... Asmodeen didn't... wasn't able to channel without Rand being there, maybe? I don't know, I don't know. I don't know, I'm holding off on my Asmodeen predictions. And then the Asherman attacked Rand. So did they go crazy? Are they actually dark friends? Or was either Logan, who just pops up as an Asherman randomly or impersonating one, or Mazrim Taim tell him to do so, tell them to do so? My guess is Taim. Taim is a slithery snake and I do not like him one bit. So yeah, we see Logan and he basically grabs the Aes Sedai that Aleda has sent to attack the Black Tower and puts them under some kind of compulsion or maybe like bonded them somehow. I don't know. I didn't really completely understand what happened, but it's definitely some kind of compulsion. And I think that the battle for the Black Tower is going to be complicated. Like, is it going to be Rand going to the Black Tower to confront Mazum Time with the Aes Sedai that he has sworn fealty to him? you know, and maybe there's a battle between the Asherman and the Aes Sedai, but Rand has the Aes Sedai on his side, or maybe it's Logan versus Mazum Taim, or maybe it's Mazum Taim and Rand versus Logan, um, and maybe it's a later sends more uh, Aes Sedai, or maybe Egwin decides to send Aes Sedai, like, it's not going to be, you know, straightforward, there might be Aes Sedai and Asherman on either side. The other storyline is Elaine has returned, and her goal is obviously to be uh, taking the crown that really is rightfully hers. My guess is that this storyline is going to be slow. And the reason I think this storyline is going to be slow or a bit of a snooze fest is because although Elaine on paper is going to be claiming the throne, she hasn't done that yet. And with her is a ton of different factions, uh, mainly uh, different women who can channel. And historically, when different factions of different women who can channel get together, things move slowly. The other storyline is Perrin's, and we don't get a ton of Perrin, but it's really set up excitedly. So Perrin goes to speak to uh, the prophet, says, hey, you need to come and see Rand. Fail discovers, and more gays discover uh, through spies, I believe it is, that 
the prophet has been meeting with Deshaun Chan. So the prophet is obviously full of bad stuff and he's he clearly has just fallen in love with the power um, of having everybody essentially bow down to him and him being in power. So it seems that there's going to be a bond between those two. Fail, more gays and a bunch of other people are captured. And although I feel sorry for them a little bit, the main exciting thing that I predict is we're going to get full insane mode Perrin. I predict rage. I predict wolves. I predict axes. I predict tavern army building. Um, I, be I believe Maniferen is going to come back because that is what he's going to have to do to get Fail back. And I can't imagine him ever stopping short of getting her back unless they kill her. And if they kill her, you know, man, I'm feel for them because Perrin on full rage mode is arguably the scariest. Rand is like insane when he's in full rage mode and obviously he's more powerful, but Perrin is like the the rage of the righteous man who has held back his rage for too long. And it's when like your quiet friend eventually just like loses their mind and loses their temper and you're like, oh no, this is gonna be bad. So am I hoping they kill Fail? Maybe just to see full rage Perrin, which is horrible of me, I know, but I don't like Fail that much. And the last thing I want to mention really about this book is there was an amazing line. And I believe it was, I can't remember exactly what it was. It might have been during the battles around Ebu Dar or maybe when he sat in the Sun Throne. And essentially Luz Theron says to him, I would not mind you in my head, Luz Theron said, if you were not so clearly mad. And obviously Luz Theron was talking to Rand and like, I don't know, it just seemed really cool and really poetic um, how both of them think the other one is crazy. And I have to give it to Jordan, like he's such a patient story builder, like I'm on book eight and I still don't really know how the magic works, like inside and out. I don't know anything really, like I know some stuff and I know a lot of things, but I know nothing also, kind of like Jon Snow. But yeah, like the most patient story builder ever of all time that I've read anyway. Um, so yeah, I've really enjoyed this book. It's been incredible. I'm looking forward to the next one. I think we're going to get a lot of pairing. I hope we return to Matt's storyline and I'm excited to learn more about the Sean Chan. So bad news, or maybe good news, I went to Barnes & Noble, which is my local bookstore, and they didn't have Winter's Heart, so I asked to order it. And it normally takes like five days. And what I normally do is order it way before um, I finish the book, but I didn't do that this time. And they also didn't have uh, the prologue in there as well. So I have a little bit of time. So I don't know what to read. I, I just finished reading a book alongside... Um, this one and it's called Think Like a Monk by Jay Shetty which is a completely different genre of book and then I also have Anna Kiranina which is very intimidating written in like the 1800s but I wanted to read some classics as well so um, I'm so excited to get back to Wheel of Time but during the five or six days I have until that book arrives I'm going to read one of uh, so I'm going to read this one as well so you'll see a couple of different genres popping up outside of that thank you so much for watching like I absolutely love you guys I really love um the comments like when you guys comment and it feels you know it kind of makes it worthwhile making videos um and let me know what were your thoughts on this book and i do have a question for you i don't know i'm always scared to google things when it comes to um this series because it's been out for so long and if you google anything you're probably gonna get spoilers what is the name of the world like the general world like is obviously i would guess that's not a spoiler right but i don't want to google anything can I know that? Does anyone know that? Has it been mentioned? What what world am I reading about? Obviously, Lord of the Rings has Middle Earth. Um, the Inheritance Cycle has Allegasia. Like there's so, there's so much, uh, so many cool worlds. But I just realized this one doesn't have a name. What is it? Other than that, please like and subscribe. You guys are awesome. Have a great day.